Hello folks, it's me again, Amanda Enderman, your trusty tour guide in the wonders of the wonderful city, also known as Rio de Janeiro. And on this video, I'm going to talk about a topic which it's more or less well known by Brazilians, but it's a very little known topic, I imagine, by foreign people, that is, people who aren't uh, Brazilian or Portuguese and what have you, which is the second bit of the growth of the city of Rio. Yes, and if you saw the thumbnail of this video and you were wondering why it's written right here, divorce, it's because this was the very fact which contributed to the growth of Rio. And not only that, it's because of this divorce, in practice at least, that Rio nowadays has a north zone and a south zone. So if you would like to know about that, stay tuned because I will talk about it in this very video. This is why, in fact, the title of this video is Growing Apart in Rio. Yes! So, without further ado, let's hop on to the theme of the video, shall we? Here we go! So, folks, of course, in every relationship, as well as in any separation, divorce, or what have you, there are, of course, two parts involved. And, of course, there are pictures, paintings, I should say, of these two parts in the thumbnail of the video as well. So, this over here is the husband, which is none other than Don Juan VI. But I'm not going to talk about him particularly in this video, because I have already spoken about him in the previous video in this series in the channel, which is called Welcoming the Gentry in Rio. And I will leave the cards for that up here, in case you want to watch it, and I hope you do. And there I talked about him a lot and all of that, but I didn't mention his wife. So, in this video, I'm going to take the advantage and I'm going to talk about her, of course. And she was none other than the princess of Spain, which was called Carlota Joaquina. And as a matter of fact, of course, the picture of her in the thumbnail is of her already older, I believe, young adult or adult. But this picture, of course, is of her when she was still a princess in Spain. Probably a picture given to Don Juan VI when they were betrothed to one another. This is very much the kind of picture which would be given to the fiancé as soon as the engagement was sealed. So, the thing with their marriage is that there are a lot of fake news here in Brazil, in fact, including in historic sources, about their marriage, saying that their marriage was bad from the get-go, and they even go so far as to say that there was violence in the middle of it. Because, you see, the fact is that they were married in the year 1785, when Carlota Joaquina was only 10 years old. And Don Juan VI, of course, was 19 years old at the time. And because she was only 10 years old, and at least here for us nowadays and in the Western world, it's quite shocking to hear of a 10-year-old getting married, even nowadays. So people normally looking at it with the eyes of nowadays, which is one of the main mistakes when you study history, I always say, you always have to look at it through the eyes of the time. But because of this, very likely early Republican fake news as well, as all the air marks of it at least. So they say that since she knew nothing about what was supposed to happen in the wedding night, when he tried to, you know, consummate the marriage, if you know what I mean, she went to Mike Tyson and bit off a piece of his ear. Yeah, they go so far as to say that. And they even go so far as to say that this is why the marriage took a long time to be consummated. Well, if any Brazilian even tells you this, you can be sure that either they have been misinformed or they are full of it. This couldn't be more fake news. 
Because the thing is that with marriages such as this, it was quite common for there to be marriages officialized, you know, in the church and everything, in which the bride or the groom or even both of them were too young biologically to actually consummate the marriage. So, of course, in these cases, even in the 18th century or 17th century, it was expected by everyone, even by the bride and the groom themselves, that the marriage wouldn't be consummated until they were biologically ready. So sometimes they knew that it would take years to consummate the marriage. It was assumed. But then you might be asking, well, but Amanda, isn't the primary purpose of marriage to produce heirs? So wouldn't it be more advantageous to just let them be engaged? until they were of age to consummate the marriage and then have the, the ceremony and such so that they could get on to producing heirs. Well, in a lot of situations, this was the case, in fact. However, in other situations, another reason for a marriage was political alliances. So sometimes the political alliance couldn't wait that long to be sealed. And in this case, this was precisely what happened and also because it was actually a double wedding that happened while Carlota Joaquina moved to Portugal to marry Dom João VI Dom João VI's sister at the same time went to Spain in order to marry the crown prince of Spain so it was a double wedding proof of this is one of the letters that Don Juan VI wrote to his sister after she was already in Spain. And the letter says as follows, literally translating from Portuguese, of course. There will still be several years until I can be with her. Catch my drift? Be with her? He means knowing her in the biblical sense, if you will which is torture. You can imagine, of course, right? He was 19 years old at the time, recently gone through puberty, his hormones all raging and such, and he had to wait. So you can imagine, of course, it would be torture. For now, we can't yet have pleasure, once again, talking about, you know, <clears throat> the, yeah, the, the, the act of consummating uh, the marriage, producing heirs and, and uh, what have you because she is still too young and her body is still too small. Well, you can see already what is shown in the picture. Of course, she wasn't prepared to produce heirs at the age of 10. Continuing, but the time will come. <laughs> and always when I read this, it cracks me up this, this part because he goes on to say, but the time will come in which we will play together <laughs> and here of course once again he doesn't mean playing chess he doesn't mean playing dominoes he doesn't mean playing hopscotch <laughs> well i'll leave it you know in between the lines what he means oh and teenagers and children that might be watching this video with the permission of your parents Okay, or preferably with them, you can ask them what I mean, if you like, and they will explain it to you the way they see fit or when they see fit. <laughs> I'm watching you. Finally, he says, and then I shall be happy. Oh my goodness, he was such a dreamer. Dare to dream, I always say. And well, the reason why I say this is because, as you can plainly see, their marriage went, at least in the beginning, according to plan. They had quite a few children together. In fact, that I can remember, at least three boys. The oldest one, Dom Pedro I and Dom Miguel. So at least three boys and quite a few girls. So they produced heirs as was expected. So in the beginning, it was all fine and dandy. However, with time, their marriage went sour. Yes, that is a fact. So the fake news is that it was bad from the get-go with the whole biting off the ear thing. And the fact is that with time, it got sour. 
And already in Portugal, it appeared in an explicit way because you see in 1805, due to the enormous pressure that was on him. And once again, if you want to know details about that, you can watch the other video, Welcoming the Gentry in Rio, where I discuss in detail about that. But because of the pressure that was on him, Don Juan VI decided to retreat from the court. And historic sources say that he had a fit of depression and decided to withdraw from the court. But come on, who here hasn't felt the need to withdraw, you know, in times of great stress? And in particular, in the last two years. <laughs> I think the whole world, from time to time, decided to do so. I'm sure you all can relate to this at this point, so who can blame him? He decided to take a little break and uh, withdraw a bit. And even without all this mess that has happened in the last few years, from time to time, we do need, you know, a bit of rest. And this is what vacations are for, in fact. So there you go. Poor guy, right? And his wife here was not understanding at all in that sense, because she tried to dethrone her husband then and there and take over the regency of Portugal herself. Oh my goodness. But gladly, Don Juan VI discovered what was happening. He arrested all the people who were involved. And from then on, he separated physically from his wife. Meaning that he did everything possible to not even see her in front of him. But for all intents and purposes, they were still husband and wife and would remain so until their deaths. Because, you see, their marriage was done by the Catholic Church, as most royal weddings were done at the time. And for those of you who aren't Catholic and may not know this, but according to the rules of the Catholic Church, and this is to this day, actually, there is no such thing as divorce as far as the Catholic Church is concerned. And yes, this is to this day. So there are instances where the marriage can be annulled, of course, but very little possibility for that. And one of these possibilities, incidentally, is if it's proven that the marriage was never consummated. But well, in this case, if there were heirs to prove the opposite, that it had in fact been more than consummated. So no grounds for annulment there. But even though, even if there were no grounds for annulment, let's be honest that in the 18th century, in the 17th century, even in the 16th century, people just separated. They just carried on with mistresses or having affairs outside of marriage, even having children outside of marriage. And their case wasn't the first and definitely wouldn't be the last. And in Portugal, it was more of a closeted physical separation, or at least they tried to do that. But when they came to Rio, that was when it became all out in terms of being explicit. Then that's when the cat went out of the bag, you know, and, and the whole shebang. Because you see, when they came to Rio, they lived for a while in the part here where it says Centro, C-E-N-T-R-O. You can look at it there. Where it says there, there's a little green square right behind it, right behind the word. They lived there, specifically at the Passo Imperial, for a while, for a very short while. But after this, they separated, going each one to one end of the city, literally, <laughs> to opposite sides of Rio. <laughs> Talk about separation there, right? So. The, the, the thing is that Don Juan VI went to where it says zoo in this picture, because, well, nowadays it is the zoo of Rio, though no zoo at the time, while Carlota Joaquina moved to where it says in the map Botafogo, written B-O-T-A-F-O-G-O. -O. But of course, she lived near to the beach at Botafogo. And with this, they contributed to the expansion of the city of Rio in these two directions. In the north zone, which is the path of the zoo that it says in the map, and the south zone, 
which goes from the neighborhood of Gloria, you can, that it says uh, right here in the map, to the neighborhood of Gavia. Just so you can better understand the urban geography of Rio, which is still in place to this day. So I hope this will make it easier if you ever decide to come to Rio and what have you. So Rio is divided into the north zone, the center or the downtown area, the south zone and the west zone. And you may be wondering, oh, but what about the east zone? The east zone would be the ocean. <laughs> so uh, where it says um, Atlantic Ocean or Oceano Atlantico, as it says in the, because in the painting it's important, that's the east zone for you. <laughs> Extending all the way to the coast of Africa. <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. So where it says Centro, once again, Centro in Portuguese means center or downtown area. That is the center of Rio, where it says Zoo, where it says Maracanã, where it says Tijuca, not Barra da Tijuca, Tijuca. Where it says Tijuca, that region is the north zone. And the area from Glória until Gavia, everything there in between, oh, including São Conrado as well, that is the south zone. And where it says Barra da Tijuca, even though many of you would say uh, Barra because of the two R's, I know, but you see, in Portuguese, double R is pronounced like H in English or like the J in Spanish. So where it says Barra da Tijuca onwards, that is the west zone. By the way, not only when it's two R's, if you go by the Carioca accent, any R will be with this sound as well. <laughs> so there you go, one more lesson in Portuguese pronunciation. But anyways, Don João VI bought the land where it says zoo in this map, and this is what it looked like when he bought it. It was just a farm, basically, with a big house in the middle, and the plot of land was called Quinta da Boa Vista. And Quinta is a size of property which actually exists to this day. It's by the size of the property. It's smaller than a farm, by the way, but still quite a few acres of land, as you can see. You may be wondering, but Amanda, okay, where is that exactly nowadays in Rio? So this is what it looks like, at least the main house, this house over here, this is what it looks like nowadays. And some of you may be familiar with this old building, and if you are, probably you saw this a lot in the news in 2018, and yes, it's because, my friends, this is the very building that caught on fire in 2018. And in fact, already at the time, I received a lot of questions from tourists when I mentioned other museums here in Rio, and they were, of course, hearing a lot about this museum on TV, so they asked if, oh, is this the one that caught on fire? At the time, I would always say no, because I wasn't referring to this particular museum, but now I am, and yes, this is the one that, unfortunately, in 2018, caught on fire. And if you want to know more about this museum, the area in general, and what's being done with it, and etc., I will one day, hopefully, make a video about this area in the series Places in Rio, so stay tuned, because we are gonna visit this park virtually, at least the part where it depends on me, it will be done, but we shall see. Of course, in order to go to the place and film it, I depend on other circumstances, but I hope I can show it to you at the place itself. Keep your fingers crossed, let us pray. Anyways, as I was saying, with this came the growth of Rio. While he bought this plot of land, Carlota Joaquina bought this place over here and had this house built for her in Botafogo. And this yellow house over here is her actual residence in Botafogo. And this residence actually had also a small chapel, which was for her use and for her guests. 
of course. And it was very common at the time to have a property and have a private church inside the property as well. And this church, the house no longer exists, but the church exists to this day. And it is this church over here. However, nowadays it is a parish of Polish Catholics. <laughs> Fancy that. So with this, you can imagine with both of them moving each one to one side of the city, the gentry, either that lived here before or that came here in 1808 with them, was divided as well. A part of the gentry followed Don Juan VI and populated the, what is nowadays the North Zone, and a part of the gentry followed Carlota Joaquina and populated what now is known as South Zone. And by the way, now that you know the story up until here, I would love to hear from you, so please leave in the comments if you were part of the gentry at the time, which of the two would you have followed? Where would you have gone to and why? I would love to know that, so please leave it in the comment section below. Let's make this channel interactive, shall we? And mind you, I read all of the comments and I answer all of the comments. So with this, with the gentry basically leaving the downtown area, uh, this contributed to the emptying of the downtown area by the rich. And this is when the downtown area begins to be a place where the lower classes would live. And this would ultimately culminate with the urban reforms of Pereira Passos in the early 20th century, as I mentioned in the video, The Mosaic Sidewalks of Rio, which I will also leave the card for you up here. And this house over here, which you can see in the painting, is one of the first examples of the, shall we say, impoverishment if there is such a word, of the downtown area. Because you see this house, as I mentioned before in other videos, such as the Making a Buck in Rio Part 2 video, this house belonged to very wealthy judges, which was the family called Tele Jimenezis, and they would rent out the rooms in this house to equally wealthy families. However, in 1790 already, so before, Don Juan VI and Carlota Joaquina came here, this house caught on fire, and after the fire, it was greatly devalued, and from then, gradually, and even more so after this exodus of the gentry, this area became populated by loose women, lower classes, beggars, and even thieves, and all of that stuff. And mostly, you know, poor people. And also, with this came naturally the expansion of Rio and you might be wondering how far did this expansion actually go at this time so going back to the map before Don Juan VI, Carlota Joaquina and the Portuguese court came here the actual city of Rio extended only as far as the area around the neighborhoods called Centro as you can see in the map and Lapa that little square or rectangle at the most was the actual urban area of Rio and all the rest that is in this map, which currently is the city of Rio, was the outskirts of the city. So imagine like those very small towns which exist in the interior of countries the world over or villages that sometimes have three main streets or even there is one street going one way and another street going the opposite way and that's it. And in the outskirts of the city, you can see farms as far as the eye can see. So this was Rio before Don Juan VI and Carlota Joaquina and the Portuguese court came here. And after this, already in 1808, the legal limits of the city of Rio were extended to incorporate the territory between the Laranjeiras River, which is in the region there where it says Laranjeiras, which is between Gloria and Botafogo, and the Rio Comprido, which is a river actually which still exists in the city of Rio to this day, and which is in the Paulo de Fronten Avenue. So the Paulo de Fronten Avenue is this street 
which splits in two and which is right beside the animal that you can see drawn there, which looks like a lion to me. I don't know, at least to me it looks like one. Right beside the lion is the Paulo de Fronten Avenue. So the limits of the city would be from there, which is the Rio Comprido, until the Rio das Laranjeiras. So you can see quite an expansion on both directions. And as you can see even further in this map, which is an updated map, as I said, it grew and grew with time. And also, even in the region of the downtown area, putting in practice a promise that he had made to the Virgin of St. Lucia, Don Juan VI had another street built in the downtown area in 1817, which also exists to this day, which was the Santa Lucia Street, and he had it built until the Ajuda Street. Now, I couldn't get a picture of the Santa Lucia Street, you know, an old picture as it was at the time, but I could get a picture of the Ajuda Street, which is right here. Of course, this picture is already from the beginning of the 20th century, but this is the Ajuda Street, specifically in the place where it meets the part of the downtown area which is called Cinelandia, which I have already shown you in previous videos, such as the video about the mosaic sidewalks of Rio. However, the original name of Cinelandia was the square of the bishop's mother. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, folks, this is another thing that always cracks me up. Well, cracks the history nerd here up, at least. Because the streets of Rio originally had very creative names, to say the least. <laughs> so it always cracks me up when I'm reading about them. And furthermore, the neighborhood of Gloria also gained importance at this time and a pier was built in the neighborhood and a wall as well surrounding the neighborhood and all of these improvements paved the way so that this market that you can see in this drawing beneath the church which is on top of the hill which is the Otero da Gloria and this is the Mercado da Gloria, or at the Market of Gloria, roughly translating. And you may be wondering, but Amanda, where is this market? I have been to Rio, and in some cases, but I've never seen this market. And I have seen pictures of Rio that friends of mine who have been there have shown me, and I've never seen this market. Well, no wonder you haven't seen this market. In fact, I have never seen it myself. And this is because it was first opened in 1858 and it was demolished in 1904. So unless you have a very good beauty regime, and if you do, please tell me, leave it in the comment section, you know, <laughs> if it is to the point that you have actually seen this market, you won't have seen this market. Well, at least not unless you have access to drawings like this one. And in fact, this is what I'm here for, right? And also, the best neighborhood in Rio, the most popular, the most beautiful, the most everything. Yes, yeah, sorry, folks, I'm talking about Catete. My neighborhood. And I know I'm not a suspect at all. I'm completely impartial when it comes to this. Imagine it. Imagine if I would be. <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. But, but really, when it comes to Catete, my ability to be impartial goes out the window, leaves the building, what have you. But anyways, let's go back to the serious business. So in point of fact, Catete was also a neighborhood that gained importance at this time. Whereas before, both Gloria and Catete and the other neighborhoods, as I said before, were suburbs, they were considered the outskirts of the city, but in this time, they gained importance. In fact, so much so that in 1810, the current Pedro Américo Street, which is this one over here, in the beginning of the 20th century, of course, and this is what it looks like nowadays. And this street was opened through the property of Bernardo José de Souza Castro. And according to records of the time, the reason why Catete also gained importance was because it possessed very noble and beautiful houses. And this time it isn't me. It's records of the time. 
So anyways, what do you think, folks? Does Catete possess very beautiful and noble buildings to this day? Did it only possess those very noble and beautiful buildings before? Or do you think it's both? You can leave that in the comment section below and I will read all the comments as I mentioned before. By the way, this yellow building right here with a clock, that is a police station, just so you know. But then you might be wondering, oh, but Amanda, okay, so far you've talked about basically the growth of what you said before is the South Zone. But you mentioned that also at this time, the North Zone grew as well. So what about that? Well, Don Juan VI, as I said before, he didn't just move to the Quinta da Boa Vista because he just liked that area for his new residence and that was that. No, it wasn't only because of that. He had a plan of urbanizing the area in between the Campo de Santana and the Quinta da Boa Vista, which let me show you in the map once again. So the area in between where it says zoo and the Campo de Santana, which is towards the end of the downtown area, this area, he intended to urbanize it and he renamed this area the New City. In Portuguese, Cidade Nova. And in fact, this region between the Campo de Santana in the downtown area and the Quinta da Boa Vista in the neighborhood of São Cristóvão is called Cidade Nova to this day. In fact, the subway station right before or right after the central station has this very name. And this isn't by accident. It's because this is the name that he intended for this region. Because, you see, it would be the new city as opposed to the old city, which was the original city limits that I spoke of between Lapa and the 15th of November Square. And so this urbanization began effectively with a decree signed by him in April 26th of 1811. And with this decree, the Caminho do Aterrado, or the landfill path, or it's also known as the Lantern Path, or in Portuguese, Caminho das Lanternas, was built in this area. And it reached this bridge over here, which is called the Sailor's Bridge, which gave access to the grounds of the Quinta da Boa Vista. So this was the growth, un up until this point at least, in the direction of the North Zone, even though there would be quite a few decades until the North Zone actually became urbanized. Because even when there were coffee plantations instead of sugar ones, the area of Tijuca, for instance, which is in the North Zone, was basically coffee plantations as far as the eye could see. So it would only be in the reign of the Emperor Dom Pedro I, because he decided to take away the coffee plantations from there in order to preserve the Tijuca forest, which exists to this day and is the largest forest inside an urban area, perhaps in all of Brazil. So folks, this concludes this video about the growth of Rio and I hope you enjoyed the video and if you did enjoy the video be sure to hit that like button, then hit the subscribe button, then don't forget to hit the notification bell so that you'll be duly notified whenever a new video comes in this channel. And most importantly, share this video with as many people as you possibly can so that each time more people may know of the wonders of the wonderful city. And as usual in this channel, I'll see you in the next video. Bye!